I'm so glad to be here, standing before the people of God, friends of uh, the people over here, and uh, to give thanks to the Lord. Um, Pastor and Joseph Brother told me to speak tonight uh, during the Thanksgiving dinner. I remember standing in the same spot two years ago, or 2019, when we had a, a similar program. We had more students at that time, Sac State, uh, uh, Sac State students were over here. And uh, it was uh, the Dodge Paul's ministry, I believe. Many students came over here. This time they all have a business, they have other things to do, so none of them showed up today this time, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, last year we had this room full of students, and praise the Lord. Uh, God is uh, good. You know, 2019, we celebrated Thanksgiving over here, but 2020 was pandemic, and we could not gather together because of restrictions. But here, the Lord has brought us this far, and uh, all in good health, so praise the Lord for that. Um, I I want to give thanks to our friend uh, Ratish, who I uh, met in Davis. Recently, I was taking my dog for a walk, and then uh, somehow we connected. You know, we met, we had a connection, and we spoke, and uh, that's how we have uh, Ratish uh, over here. And there's another family who could not make it because they have uh, gone on a vacation. That family I met when I was running on the street, I started <laughs> speaking in Malayalam, and then I had to put a pause over there because in Davis there's not many Malayalis over there, right? And so I met that family also, and these two families had come to our ELC picnic that we had a few weeks ago. So here they are again, welcome brother, thank you very thank much you. for coming. Thank you. So um, we are here and we are going to speak from the Bible, from the Word of God. You know. I, I want to start with an example or a parable. You know, long time ago, long time ago, uh, there was a young boy when he visited a village, you know, right way in our house in Kerala. It's a village, two houses on on, on, on uh, towards our house, you know, very close to our, in our neighborhood. There is a blacksmith. The blacksmith. I could hear this clanging sound every morning, every time this clanging sound. So one day I asked my father, what is this sound? You know, and so he said, come, let's go see it. So it's not too far away, just a couple of houses uh, down the road. We went there and we saw this clanging sound became bigger and bigger. When we went there, we saw a blacksmith uh, with another guy who was tall and muscular. He's holding a very really large hammer very strong big sledgehammer in his hand and the other guy the blacksmith he's holding a red hot iron the tip of the iron is bright it's red hot and he has put this on an anvil anvil is a very really strong piece of metal that they put it and the strong guy his job is only just hammering this this particular metal he reach he, he raises hammer and with full forces he'll bring it down and this blacksmith will hold the rod, this red hot iron bar in a, in, in, in a particular way so the hammer comes and falls on it and it keeps a particular shape. So I was watching this and my dad started, started telling me that um, you know this, this blacksmith he makes grills and knives and other things you know they actually have to make this metal very hot so that they can bang on it and give it a shape. You know when I was watching this you know then all of a sudden this Blacksmith, he stopped working because he knows my dad, and we started talking. And I asked this question to him. You know, I know this man has a hammer in his hand. You're holding a red hot bar or uh, an iron bar in your hand. But I'm looking at that anvil. It's called an anvil where the, the force of the hammer falls on the metal. The metal is on a strong foundation. Foundation is called the anvil. I do not know what you call it in Malayalam for that. But that is in English, it is called an anvil. It's a very strong metal which stands out. So my, I, my question to the person was, I understand that you're hitting this thing, but I'm wondering about that surface, that anvil, how long does it stand? How much pressure can it take? And the blacksmith told me this, hey, that anvil is about a hundred years old. A hundred years old. <coughs> and uh, this, an this anvil, I've seen a thousand hammers like this. The hammers will break, but the anvil will not break. It is very strong and it can take on a lot of pressure. 
Friends, brothers and sisters, why did I say this? Our life is a shortcoming in this world. But it's very important that we base our life on the truth. It has to have a solid foundation. A solid foundation. We cannot base our life on a bubble, on illumination, on mythology. It has to be based on the truth, a real truth. The truth that will take you not only a few years over here, but can also take you to eternity. And so with that, I would like to introduce to you the Bible, the Word of God. This Word of God, it's called the Word of God, the Holy Bible. This book has 66 books in it. It's a collection of 66 books. This Bible is a collection of a library of 66 books. It is divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the dividing line between this Old Testament and the New Testament is Jesus Christ himself. Before the Jesus Christ was born in this world, after, before his, or born in this world, after his uh, death and ascension into heaven, books were written. These books are called the New Testament. But before Jesus Christ arrived into this planet, into this earth, the books that were written is called the Old Testament. And the books have chapters within them and the chapters have verses within them. So if I tell you, okay, this book and this particular chapter and this particular verse, people are able to pick it up very quickly. And I say this, that this book is not written yesterday or a few years ago, but the oldest book of, the first book of this Bible is called the book of Genesis. It was written about 1200 to 1500 years ago. Before 1500 years before Jesus Christ, so around 3500 years ago it was written. This book is the one of the oldest book. It has 39 books in the Old Testament and 29 books in the New Testament, so a collection of 66 books. And we call it the Holy Bible. And it is similar to the anvil. Why? Because on it we can base our foundation. Our foundation can be based on the solid rock. That is the Lord Jesus Christ, his, his word, the Holy Bible. It was written by 40 different authors, but it was written even though they wrote it down, the inspiration came from heaven. Inspiration came from God. And so we call the Bible as the, as the inspired word of God. It is not a human uh, thought and collection, but it is a thought that is given to, from God to people and they wrote down according to the inspiration that they received from the Spirit. And they wrote it down. And so these books is a collection of 66 books written by 40 different authors by the inspiration of God himself. And so we call it the word of God. And this word of God has gone through a lot of objections, a lot of uh, abuse by people. Many people try to destroy the Bible. But the Bible has stood its ground for all these ages, all these centuries. People try to destroy and eliminate this book because they didn't want it. They didn't like it and they want to destroy it. But who can destroy God's word? Because God endures forever. His word endures forever. No man can destroy it. In fact, this book is one of the oldest book in the history of man. And this book has changed many people's life. And so today, I'm glad to stand before you and use certain words from the Bible and explain it to you. See, now we have a clear foundation. It is not mythology. It is not a bubble. It is not anything that is uh, temporary. It is not culture. It is not people or human understanding of human uh, philosophy. But it is the word of God. The Bible says, Grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Why? Because God is forever. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. If he has no beginning, he has no end, his word will never end. His word endures forever. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So God's word is an inspired word of God. It is authoritative because God is the author of this book. He says it and things don't change. See, if I write something today, I stand for something today, culture changes tomorrow, I may change my views about it, right? I may one day say, you know what, abortion is not good. But after some time, I'm going to say, okay, abortion is good. Marriage is between a man and a woman. But after that, people change their plans, change according to the culture. But God of the Bible doesn't change. Why? Because whatever he said at the beginning, 
and whatever he says today is all the same he doesn't change as the culture changes as season changes the word of the lord doesn't change so we can stand on the promises of god's scripture so bible consists of history of mankind it stands it has a lot of prophecies that things going to come it has also have fulfilled prophecies of the things that were prophesied in the past these things has all happened and it also talks about the future so when the things of the past has happened and everything that has happened according to the word of god we can also say what's happening what's written for the future will all will also happen according to the word of god so praise the lord hallelujah brothers the word of god is living and active so this is a real book this book even though it has it is printed in a printing press over here the pages don't really have any magical power some people take this bible and put it under their pillow case and go to sleep so that they may not have bad dreams but those are all myth those are not real what really matters is reading it understanding it meditating on god's word and putting your trust in this word i i was telling my friends as they came to our house the other day you know when i came to this country 22 years ago i was by myself i had no support system my parents were in india my church was in india our pastor our friends were all in india i was all by myself in this country but god was over here God of the Bible is everywhere. He is Almighty, All Knowing, All Present. God. He is a Spirit, Infinite, Eternal, Unchangeable in His being. Wisdom, Power, Holiness, Justice, Goodness, and Truth. That is our God. He is over here. And so, when I pray to God in my distress, God gave me a verse, and He said, "Fear not. Fear not, for I am with you." Isaiah chapter forty-one, verse ten says, "Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God." I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you in my victorious right hand. He promised me one day, early morning, four o'clock, when I was troubled in my spirit, I prayed to God, and God answered me, and He gave me this word. And as I received this word, I received it with with faith. I received it, and I said, God, I'm going to hold on to Your promises. And I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, 22 years have passed. He has held me in His hand, and this far He has brought me. I have all these friends and witnesses over here. I came by myself, but now I have a family. I have a family in the church. I have friends like Ratesh over here. Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! So God's word, when He tells you something, He is true to His word, and He always will keep it because He is no man to change His word. Man may promise something today, but tomorrow they may go back. But God, if He promises you something, even though we are faith, we are faithless, or we check, we turn away from it, He will always keep His promise because if He said it, He will surely do it. Hallelujah! So with today's words that I want to read from, I understand today's Thanksgiving, we are Thanksgiving celebration, right? So I would like to read a verse from the Bible and go from them. So let's, if you have the Bible, let's turn to the book of Colossians. It is in the New Testament, Colossians. Chapter one, verse twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. I just read it out to you um, because of the lack of time. Colossians chapter one, chapter uh, chapter one, verse twelve, thirteen, and fourteen says, "Give thanks to God the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom." We have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. All right, giving thanks to God the Father. God created man according to the Bible. The first book of the Bible is Genesis, and Genesis chapter one one starts by saying, "In the beginning, God." First four words of the Bible: "In the beginning, God." God already existed. In the past, there is no beginning for God. If God had a beginning, then He could not exist as God. But somebody had to create Him. But God already exists. The God of the Bible already exists. You cannot define Him by saying somebody made Him. No, He already was there, and He created everything. Genesis one two talks about the account of creation. But in and Genesis chapter one was thirty first verse. The last verse of the chapter says God created everything. Including man, and said that it was all good. God created man very good. That's what the Bible says. If God said it, I don't want to argue or debate about it. That should just settle the matter. If God wrote, 
man was created good. I'm not going to argue with God. Who am I to argue? My puny, my, my fragile body. I do not have that wisdom to argue with God. But if God of the Bible says that he created man good, that should be all. Okay, right? That settles the matter. But then what happened? In Genesis chapter 3, the fall happened. Fall is when Adam and Eve, first parents, they, they, they sinned against God and they fell from grace. In Genesis chapter 3, we talk, we speak about the introduction of sin. Genesis chapter 3, we see the introduction of sin. It's okay, just leave it on. Just leave it, just leave it. Okay. All right. So Genesis chapter 3, again, let's uh, pay attention over here, brothers and sisters. Genesis chapter 3, we talk about sin. What is sin? Let's define sin. Sin is nothing but a violation of God's law. Anything that God said you shall not do, and if you do that, you are violating God, you are disobeying God, and that is considered as sin. And Adam and Eve sinned against God because they ate from the forbidden tree. They were given one commandment, that you shall not eat from the forbidden tree, but they ate it. They fell to the deception of the devil, and they fell, and sin was introduced into man's life. And then in Genesis chapter 6, we read Every thought and inclination of the human heart was wickedness continually. Every thought, every imagination, everything that man did was wickedness continually. Because if you read, because we don't have the time to go, the details of this, man had to leave the presence of God because holy God and unholy man cannot live together. Like light and darkness cannot dwell together, unholy God, unholy man and unholy God cannot dwell together. There cannot be a purity and impurity mixed together. So man had to depart from God's presence. He was led out of the garden of Eden and he was under the control of the devil. And then the devil led him. And what does the devil do? Do everything that is against God. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 that every thought, everything that man did was continuously sin. Jeremiah chapter uh, Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. The human heart is desperately sick. Now see, these are the diagnosis of God revealing it to Jeremiah the prophet that man has become very sick. Every, according to God's diagnosis, man can continuously see, continuously since he doesn't do anything good. Hallelujah. So here is the first verse that we just read. It says that man... Give thanks to God the Father who qualified you to share in the inheritance. Do we have any qualification? See, when I was in, a, was I remember, see, all of us students are working very hard so they can prepare the perfect resume, right? They can show a qualification of all these degrees and experience that they have so that they can have their dream job, right? Everybody is looking, all of us students are working hard. Many of you have already accomplished that. You have the job that you are looking forward. But everything requires you to be qualified, right? I remember when I went for my kindergarten class, the principal gave me an examination. Now, I am like four years old or five years old. He said, write A, B, C, D, you know, alphabets. All the 26 alphabets I had to write C. In kindergarten also to get an admission into kindergarten, I was examined. I had to go through a test. They checked whether I am qualified to be in kindergarten. Right? If you go to a job, they look at your resume. They won't just look at your resume, but they may ask a few questions to see whether you are qualified. Right? And here the word says, God the Father qualified you to share in the inheritance. What qualification do I have? To be in heaven. According to the Bible, all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That means a person who has committed even a single sin cannot enter the presence of God, but he has to be thrown into hell. That's two destinations for mankind a heaven and a hell. Hell was created for the devil and his demons as punishment place. But everybody who follows the devil will have to go to hell. But how can man who has sinned against God go back into the presence of the Holy God? We are not qualified. 
we cannot qualify ourselves. We have sinned, we have stained, we have sinned within us, we cannot do good. A child when is born, the Bible says, the child is born in trespasses and in sin. As soon as the child is born, the Bible says the child is born in sin. The child is born in sin because he has inherited sin. See, when a child is growing up, you don't have to teach the child to lie, do you? You don't have to teach the child to lie. It is a natural inherited uh, behavior. As soon as the kid did something that is wrong, and the father comes and says, did you do it? Out of the fear of punishment, the child will say, what? No, I did not do it. It's a lie. One of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness. How shall not apply? It is one of the violation of God's command. So a child, when he grows up, or every human being naturally commits sin. It is inbuilt in us. We are not qualified to inherit the kingdom of God. But what are we qualified for? We are qualified for one thing, that is eternal hell. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, man has two things, or three things actually, but let's focus on two things. This is our body. You see me. But this is just a shell that you see. The real me is inside me, which is called the soul. Right? It's the real me which is inside me, that is the soul. But outside, this is the body. This is how I look. This is just the frame. The Bible says, from dust you were created, to dust you shall return. Right? What happens? I may live for 70, 80, maybe I may hit a century, 100 years. But at the end, what happened? I have to die. There's three realities in the Bible, maybe more, but three realities that is very specific. A person who is born into this world, they have a date of birth, but they will have to die someday. Right? There's a limitation. You can't live forever. I had a neighbor when I moved to Davis at this house that I live in. I had an 80 year old neighbor next door. He came to greet us and invite us to Davis and all that. So, and he gave me his business card while he was leaving. And the business card said this, I intend to live forever. Good intention. I intend to live forever. Five years later, he died. He's no more. But he intend to live forever. We can have beautiful, great intention, but we have limited time in this world. That's a body. But there's a soul within us that never dies. That never dies. It, is, it lives forever and ever. So if a person is dead, we say this is the body of that person, correct? Right? But when the person, we will not say that person by his name, we'll say that is the body of a so-and-so person. But the person has already left his body. So the soul is, that's why David says, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Not the body. Bless my soul, oh my body. No. The body is going to go to the dust. But what remains forever is the soul. There's two destinations for the soul. The soul may either go to heaven or go to hell. But according to the Bible, God's diagnosis, all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin means the implication of sin is eternal hell or eternal death or eternal condemnation. No man can enter into the presence of the Holy God and say, God, I am going to be with you. No, you can't. You are not qualified. But this verse over here says, give thanks to God the Father who qualified you. I am not qualified. In my sinful state, if I die today, I have one destination, that is hell. Brothers and sisters, we have a reason to give thanks to the Lord. It says, give thanks to God the Father. Here is where I want to show, talk to you about the hope of man. See, we did not have hope. But our God knew that. God saw a vast majority of people, there is no hope for man. They are all going to go to hell. And God devised a plan. God said, how can we save the sinful man. How can we pave a way for him to come back to heaven? And God the Father decided to send his only begotten son Jesus Christ into this world. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not die, should not be condemned to hell, but may have eternal life with God.
Hallelujah. Who took the initiative? It is God the Father. I did not call upon him. He took the initiative and said, you know what? We should do something for this fallen man. He was deceived into sin and so we should do something about this. And God said, you know what? I am going to send my son, God's son himself, Jesus Christ, into this world. Now let me tell you, brothers, I am a very kind person. I love my brother so much. So I will say, you know what? I am going to pay the price for your sin and I am going to die for you and, and pay the price for your sin. But God says, no, 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 you are not eligible. How can you be eligible? You yourself is a sinner. How can you pay the price of another person, right? So I am uneligible. I am not eligible. I myself is a sinful person. I cannot pay the price for another person. But God the Father planned this way. See, I'll tell you one thing. That God is a God. He's a God of love. He's a holy God. But he's also a God who judges correctly. He's a holy judge. He cannot come with a plan today or a rule today or a law today and change the law conveniently. Man may do it. We may do it. We may come with a law and tomorrow we don't like the law because it's not convenient for us. We may come up with a new law to supplement the other law. Correct? We may come up with all these things. But God doesn't do that. If he says this is sin, if disobeying parents is a sin, or, or worshipping an idol is a sin, if he says that you cannot lie, lying is a sin, he doesn't change his mind. He always would keep it as sin. But So what happened? Man has sinned and there is no way for us to go to heaven. And so God brought sin, the son Jesus into this world. We know the story. 2000 years ago, Jesus was, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He lived 33 and a half years in this world and then he died. He died on the cross, gave up his, he was, gave up his life on the cross. I'll tell you, it's a brutal death to, 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 to die on the cross. It is a slow and painful death. It is very excruciating. It's painful. It is very painful to die on the cross. You know what they did to Jesus? What they did to Jesus, they said, you are the king of the Jews, right? And they gave him a crown of thorns. They took a crown of thorns and hammered it into his skull. They took his two nails and he put it on the side of the cross and they nailed his hand to the cross. And then his two feet were nailed and his chest was pierced. Let me tell you brothers and sisters, the sins that you committed, you and I committed without our mind, he took the punishment upon himself. The crown of thorn, he wore it because I and you had to wear it. But God is a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. God says, I will have compassion on those who I have compassion. I want to have mercy upon those who I have mercy. And he had mercy upon the whole world. He sent his son and said, here, wear this crown. Romans chapter 4 verse 29 says this. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life. Romans chapter 4 verse 29, he was delivered over to death. Who delivered Jesus to death? It is not the Romans, it is not the Jewish people. God himself delivered his own son to death on the cross. He took the pain and suffering that we had to take upon his own son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The crown that he wore, it is because of the sins that you and I committed with our mind. The wrong thought, the wrong motives that came into our mind. He took the punishment for our sins. His hands were pierced. The sins that we committed with our hands, the punishment fell upon Jesus' hand. The, plat, the path, the, for the, the wrong path that we walked, the things that we did with the places that we went with our feet, he took the nails upon his leg. Brothers and sisters, he took our punishment. His back was beaten. The flash, the flogging that had to come on my back, he took those flogging. And his chest was beaten. His chest was pierced. The sins that you and I committed with our hearts. He paid the price on the cross. Hallelujah. He became the perfect sacrifice for us on the cross. Hallelujah. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Means what? If a person has to die, if a person has to be forgiven, blood has to be shed. And that's why in the Old Testament we read of a lot of animal sacrifices. But this animal sacrifice was pointing to the ultimate sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross. And because of that sacrifice, there's no more sacrifice.
sacrifice required. The blood was shed. It was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Every drop of his blood was given up on the cross for us. And at the end, Jesus said on the cross, Lord, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. It is what? The work that you told me to come and accomplish on this cross, in this world. He was born to die. He was born to become the sacrifice. And Jesus Christ paid that price for our sins. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now we are qualified. Who is qualified? It is whoever believes in him. Believes on Jesus Christ and the work that he did. Believes that he paid the price for my sins on the cross. Those are the people who are qualified to enter the kingdom of God. Over here it says what? Give thanks to God the Father. Why? Because he ordained salvation. He planned salvation for us fallen people who have no hope to go to heaven. We had no hope. This hope was given because God said, let's make a plan of salvation. Salvation is nothing but to be saved from eternal hell. From, from eternal hell where there is no way coming out. Hallelujah. But God has given us an opportunity. This is an opportunity for us to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are qualified to give thanks to the Lord? Those who have repented of their sins. Means what? I am a sinner. I am the chief of sinners. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. And who have thoroughly or truly the godly sorrow has repented of their sins and asked for forgiveness of sins and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Those are the people who are qualified to enter into the kingdom of God. Dear brothers and sisters, I want to ask you this question. This chapter, this verse 12, 13 and 14 is a very heavy verse very rich in meaning. If you start speaking from this, it might take many, many, many hours to finish it. But I just want to stop on the word qualification, asking the question, we, are, we were not qualified to enter the kingdom of God. But it is God who works salvation. Salvation from beginning to the end is the work of God. You cannot do anything for your salvation. It is God who has to work in your heart and you call upon God. Have God have mercy upon me. Blind Bartimaeus called upon Jesus said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Hallelujah. And Jesus had mercy upon blind Bartimaeus. He was able to see. And afterwards we read, blind Bartimaeus went on rejoicing and followed Jesus. Hallelujah. Similar situation happened to the Philippine jailer. The Philippine jailer asked a very crucial question. What must I do? What must I do to be saved? The question over here is, what must I do to be saved from eternal hell, from eternal damnation? What must I do to do to be saved? And, uh, and, Paul, and Apostle Paul said this, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. See, if people had asked, okay, you have to run a hundred miles. Probably many people would have done it. I can't do it. Many people would have done it. If, 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 the, if the requirement for salvation is that you have to climb Mount Everest, many of us would not be able to do it, right? If the requirement is for something that extraordinary that you have to do, many skilled and many strong people would do it, but fragile people like you and me may not be able to do it. But here's a very simple thing. Very simple thing. All that you have to believe is believe in the sacrifice of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that has happened on the cross. Appropriate it to your life. Say, I believe in Him. And if you believe in Him, the peace of God that transcends all human understanding will come into your life and it will give you the peace. I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, my wife used to work in a convalescent hospital. Honorless hospital people come over there. Usually they don't go out of that. They just die and they go, okay? They're old people, sick people. Most of the people never make it out of the convalescent hospital. But there are some people who come over there who have this faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They might have lost their mind. They might be going through dementia, chambers. They can't think, they can't recognize even people who they have been there with for a long time. They, are, they have lost their mind. But their heart is full of joy for the Lord, hallelujah. Even in that sixth state, even they are about to die, they always are giving glory to God, they are praising the Lord. Why? Because their joy is within. It is not mental lesson. You cannot just learn something and say, you know what, I believe, no, it has to be from within. 
The joy of the Lord should be from within. When you repent of your sin, it has to be within. There should be a change in the life of a person. The Bible says, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you become a new creation. The old has passed away. The things that I used to like in the past, I don't like anymore. I become a new creation. I used to be a thief. I used to be a liar. I used to love things that are very bad. But now when God has has worked in my life and have repented of my sins, I made a 180 degree change and now I love righteousness. I hate wickedness. I work with my hand. I used to be drunk before. I used to beat up my wife and my children before. But now when God works in me, I'm a different person. I'm a changed person. I'm a new creation. See, God has qualified you. Hallelujah. This is the qualification that I want. That Christ be born in you. And once Christ is born in you, you become qualified. And with that person who has this, who has this living hope, that Christ is within me, they are the one who gives thanks to God the Father. Before they were, their father was the devil, but now when they repented, they turned away from their sin. God has become their father again. The relationship that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden, they, they used God was their father. The relationship was broken because of the introduction of sin. But now this forgiveness of sin, the relation has been restored. Now God becomes our father. Hallelujah. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks if you have been recognized by God. See, it's one thing to know God and it's a different thing for God to know you. You know, in Matthew chapter 25, I believe, we talk about the 10 virgins over there. Five made it, five did not make it. And the five who did not make it tried to knock at the door and a word came out from the other side of the door. I never knew you. I never knew you. See, you cannot live in this world as a, as a Christian or a person who, who, who knows everything theoretically, but your life doesn't reflect that. Your life has to change. It has to start with repentance. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, we did not act, but God acted in history. God acted for us. He is the one who provided a lamb that was slain. You remember the story of Abraham. God tested Abraham and said, go take your son to Mount Moriah and kill him. Sacrifice your only, only son. Go to Mount Moriah, which is a three day walk, a three day travel. They had to travel three days before they can reach the, the mountain. And they reached three days. And now we can understand Abraham, only son, he got in his old age, he has to be sacrificed. And God told him to go and he went. Early morning, he got up, his son and two servants on a donkey, ready to go. They went all the way to Mount Moriah and they said to the servants, wait over here, we will go. We will go up and sacrifice and we will return. And Abraham and his son took the knife to the wood and everything, went up to the mountain and at the very top, the son asked the father, Father, I have to ask you something. I think we are missing something over here. We have the fire, we have the knife, but where is the lamb that has to be killed? What's and uh, Abraham said one thing, the Lord will provide. God will provide. I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, God has provided a son for us. His name is Jesus Christ. If you believe in him, the Bible says, if you believe in him, you shall not perish. You shall not be destroyed. You shall not be condemned, but you shall have eternal life. Brothers and sisters, I want to stop over here because I think I'm running out of time. No, we run out of time. So here is the gift, the reason why we have to give thanks. The only reason, we may have many things for this world. We are thankful for our family, we are thankful for the job, the car, the house and everything. But these are all temporal things. I'll tell you, the soul lives forever. And give thanks to the Lord if your soul is saved and you're on your way to heaven. I'll tell you, give thanks if God, if you have not surrendered your life yet, you have an opportunity while we are still breathing. While we are still breathing, we have an opportunity to give thanks to the Lord, receive the sacrifice that was done on the cross for the Lord Jesus Christ, and the salvation will be yours also. Brothers and sisters, would you surrender your life? If you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, come and speak to me or to pastor, and the gift of salvation shall be yours too. This is not mythology. This is not a, a fairy tale. This is not fantasy. This is not a made up story. This is the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord stands forever. The flowers may fade, the grass will wither, but the word of the Lord stands forever. 
you will and I will pass away. But God's word has been there for centuries and centuries. This word of God has been transforming people's life. I hope your life is also transformed through the word of God. I'm just a messenger. I'm just giving you what God's word is. This word is what you have to receive. Receive it faith. Change your life. Depend not. Depend on it. Depend on God's word. Surrender your life to God. And you also shall have eternal life with God. And here it says, give thanks to God the Father who qualified you to share in the inheritance. Our inheritance is in heaven. We are a temporary people over here. Our citizenship is in heaven. If you are called by God, you are his child. Then you can be thankful. As I was saying, people in the convalescent hospital, when the believers who die in Christ, even at the moment of their death, they are very joyful. They are very joyful. But people who are outside Christ, you can see the fear, the fear of the coming judgment. As Pastor said last Sunday, three realities, right? They again mentioned in the Bible. You're born, you have to die. And there's a judgment. That's another reality. People don't talk about it. It says in the Bible, for it is appointed for a man to die and face judgment. It appointed for a man to die. He has to die first. And the next thing, his soul goes to heaven. He has to stand before the judgment seat of God and give an account of what happened in this world. Dear brothers and sisters, we, can't, we cannot stand before God because we have so many sins within us. But we can stand because God, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, cleansed us from our sins. But one last point before I stop, Pastor, something just came into my mind. I have to tell it because if I don't tell it, it would be very incomplete. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, two things happened. He, he died for your sins. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are all forgiven. But you are still empty. You do not have anything. But here it is. The second thing that happened on the cross is the righteousness of Jesus Christ was imputed into your account. Okay? It's like I was in debt, but somebody paid my debt. Yes, my debt has been paid, but my bank balance is still zero. I don't have any money. But the rich man said, you know what? I know you don't have any money. Here's a lot of money into your account. And when Jesus Christ died, he imputed his righteousness into our account. So when God the Father sees from heaven, he doesn't see our unrighteousness. He sees the righteousness of Christ. It only happens when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you become qualified for heaven. With this, 